Everywhere I go, everywhere I be, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. he's mine. In the
greatly to be praised and we are to magnify his holy name. Admittedly that we are living in a uh, twisted, evil, sinful, distorted culture. And this culture leans toward self-aggrandizement, lifting up man, his achievements. But no matter in terms of what man tries to do to turn the picture around, God will always demand that we glorify him. And everything that we read in his holy word from Genesis to Revelation lets us know that God is to be glorified. Because all flesh is grass. The grass withers and it dies. It fades away, but the word of God will stand forever. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 39 to 42, I want to have a continuation and an extension from the message last Sunday when we talked about the Samaritan woman at the well. And these verses, 39, 40, 41, and 42, it carries us into a different genre, a different mindset, a different arena. And in terms of what she said and what other people said. So if you will open your Bible, and doesn't matter about your translation, whether it's King James, New King James, NIV, American Standard, uh, living Bible, whatever the case might be. Uh, I think Reverend Harden is the one that says, if you can stand. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 39 to 42 of the uh, Gospel of John. And if you uh, were in such a hurry that you went off and forgot your Bible, that's all right. It should be somebody close in, this, in your area. Or if not, well, no, I can't catch my eyes with that can <laughs> used to, but anyway. I'll be reading, well, uh, I'll start, start us out reading, because mine is the New International Version. Beginning at verse 39, and let us read together in unison. Many... He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, and he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, Savior of the world. Amen. So end if the reading of God's blessed, holy, and life-giving word. Jesus is Lord. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is Lord. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but life has a basic fundamental rule. And if you are not acquainted with it, I want to share it with all of us. You may know it in a different context, or you may know it a different way. But that rule is basically this. Life offers no guarantees. Life offers no guarantees. Therefore, there are no guarantees in life. Now, I think before I go any further, in order that we get the scope of the context of this, uh, of this scripture, let's define the word guarantee. We have a general knowledge of it. But Webster says that a guarantee is when a person or a cooperation assume 
and pledge responsibility for the quality and durability of a product or service. They stand behind it. For an example, when I was coming up, the corporation Sears, uh, how many of y'all remember Sears and how they backed up their, uh, all of the um, items that they made, whether you bought a refrigerator, washer, dryer, stove, whatever it was. You, Sears was dependable, what is it? And they, and they just didn't give a guarantee in words, and then if something happened, it broke down, then they would come and say, well, I'm sorry, you got to pay some more money, blah, blah, have it fixed. They stood behind their product, and they made a good product. It was durable. It lasted. Now, admittedly, we don't live in this day and time. We don't have that type of uh, solidarity of corporations, even in terms of the products that they make or even standing behind their products. If they do, then if the repairman comes out, uh, nine times out of ten, he will say, well, I got to charge you something for service call, you know. Sears never did say that. <laughs> Amen. Life cannot ensure or give certainty that everything in our lives will turn out as we plan or as we dream. For an example, from the cradle to the grave, life cannot guarantee and tell you and me that we will have excellent health until we die, that there will be no breakdown. First of all, because time and gravity pull on all of us. And the, I guess maybe about the only way we can, we can eliminate gravity or get around gravity, you have to get in a spaceship and go beyond the Earth's gravity. But then time is going to get you. Not only life cannot afford me to say that I will have excellent health all of my life, that I will never get sick, never catch a cold, never go in the hospital, never have an uh, operation, my teeth won't fall out, whatever the case might be, won't break some bones. Basically, that's a part of the narrative of life. Life cannot guarantee that even though I want wealth, but that I will have wealth, or that if I have it, I won't lose it. Life cannot give me a guarantee. Life cannot give me a guarantee about fame. Many people want fame. They, they, they want other folk to, uh, to notice them. Uh, this, uh, what they call this TMZ program that comes on, and they talk about all the stars and the bizarre stupidity that they do, young and old, you know, this sort of thing. They have fame, and they are known by maybe the talent that they have, their singing, uh, their ability, whatever the case might be. But if you notice that many of them that rise to the top of the fame ladder, somewhere in their lives, something happens, and they plummet back down to the bottom. And they lose that fame. So life cannot guarantee that. Life cannot guarantee you and me a great name before we leave here. Life cannot tell me that after I'm gone that, they will name a holiday after me like Dr. Martin Luther King. No, 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 no. I, I was watching uh, um, uh, Steve Harvey Friday, and uh, he was celebrating, I think, his 57th, 58th birthday. And they were showing, in terms of where he was born, in Cleveland, Ohio, and the street he was born on, they showed the house he uh, was born in, and those that are still living, his his compatriots, his buddies and everything. And the street that he lived on, they named the street after him. Well, he's one of the blessed ones that God has allowed uh, to become, what, famous, to have a name. But one thing that I did know, that I have noticed about uh, Steve Harvey, that he appears to be humble in his fame and in what God is blessing him with. Amen. Life cannot 
guarantee me that I will have big earnings in my life. When you're young, you're a teenager, and you're 20s, and they tell you if you go and get a degree that you can have a salary, six, seven, eight figures, you know, and you dream about that as just like little visions of sugar plums, you know, dancing in your head. But then as you go along in life, you find out everybody is not going to achieve that. If you can maintain a decent lifestyle, have something on your table to eat, if there's no more than beans and cornbread, and have something in the refrigerator, and have a roof over your head, and have warmth, you are blessed. Life cannot guarantee me beauty. I can be born with beauty, but it doesn't mean I'm going to end with beauty. Because as all of us know, beauty what? Fades. And, uh, well, I'll leave that alone. I'm going to move on from that one. Because I see some of the ladies, they are beginning to give me that eye. Life cannot guarantee that I will have a, a large group of friends that are real friends, that, uh, that I will have valid friendship all of my life. Because all of us realize this. Friends come and go. And even if you had good friends maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, then uh, you may not see them anymore in this lifetime. You develop new friendships. But God's Word tells us that a real friend, not acquaintances, not people that want to use you, I want to be a friend to you because of your status, that they can get something from you or through you, but God's Word says a real friend, what, sticks closer than a biological brother does. Life cannot guarantee that I will be in a culture that is invigorating, that is encouraging, that will lift my spirits, that will be positive all of my life because you're going to always run into those, I call those puddles of bad company. All of us have. And because of our training, or if you were brought up in a religious home, you were taught religious values. And uh, if you accepted Christ at an early age, then the Holy Spirit told you that if you were with people that were going to pull you down or use you, that something told you, get away, move in another direction, because this person or these individuals will not bless your life. And we know that to be a fact. Everybody that we come into contact with doesn't bless our lives. Only a few people God uses to do that. There are many other things in our life that uh, uh, life cannot guarantee. But out of all that life cannot guarantee, there is one exception to this rule. One exception. And that exception, you spell it G-R-A-C-E, grace. Didn't know that, did you? Grace is validated, backed up, and secured by Jesus Christ. And in the third chapter of John, verse 16, when he says that he has come to give light and to bring salvation to the whole world and in who believe in him will have what? Eternal life. That's not just a statement off the top of his head. He can back it up. Let me prove it. Because the question can be given in a rhetorical sense. How can Jesus guarantee grace? Have you ever thought about that? How can this fellow that the woman met at the well, that the Samaritans that were in that town, and they said he's the savior of the world, or what makes him so dynamic? What is it about him or what is it in him, or what is it behind him that he can make such an audacious and bold assertion 
that I can give you eternal life. I can save your soul. I can carry you to heaven. You don't have to die and go to hell. Notice how I said that real quiet because folk nowadays don't want to hear that term hell. Hell doesn't exist anymore. But that's not what my Lord tells me. He talks about hell more than he talks about money. Amen? Now, how can Jesus back up his claim? Simply because he is God in man's flesh without man's sinful nature. And he can do it. Now, there's another area of a guarantee. A guarantee is no better than the person who underwrites or stands behind the guarantee. And if that person is capable of fulfilling the guarantee, which means pay paying the obligation of the guarantee, then Christ is qualified in three basic areas. And I'm through. Can he back it up? Yes. Can he pay the price? Yes. Does he have the power to follow through? Yes. There are three basic areas that he qualifies. Area number one is his character. His character. His character, thank God, is not like my character and your character. His character is flawless. It is impeccable. It is pure. It is undefiled. God can trust himself, but he can't trust me. Case in point. Go back to the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. I think it's the 15th or 13th chapter where God, uh, he made a covenant agreement with Abraham. You remember? And he told Abraham, I'm going to, you're going to be the, uh, you're going to be the, the head honcho of all of these races of people. And it was a custom in that day that if you, and um, just say myself and Flint, if we made an agreement and we shook hands to validate that, we would take an animal, we would cut him in half, we would take the two halves, lay them side by side. Flint would walk through it, and he would repeat, if I break my word, if I don't keep, keep my word, it, it will, I will be dead like this animal. Then I would walk through the two halves and repeat the same thing. That would bind us together. But we know in this day and time, words don't mean nothing to folk no more. A person can give their word Maybe you can, maybe you can't. And then if you assess their character, still there are some ifs there. Amen? But when God gives his word, there are no ifs. And notice the drama tells us that when Abraham, and this is so beautiful, I love it. When Abraham got ready to walk between the halves to keep his part of the bargain, what did God do? Just like a doctor carries you to the operating room, put him to sleep. And let me say it my way, while he was snoring, God walked through the halves. And not only did God pledge his part, but he pledged for Abraham's part. Amen? And when Abraham woke up, it was over with. The surgery had been done. The patient was going to what? Survive. And the patient was going to live. And that's the reason why you and I today in all of the hell, the problems, the trouble, the stress, the strains of life that we are going through now, don't put your trust in yourself, number one. For Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, lean not to your own understanding. You might be smart, but you ain't smart enough to figure out what tomorrow is going to bring. You're not smart enough to figure out how many more years you're going to live, how you're going to die, 
where it's going to be, what you're going to be going through before you hit that barrier. You don't have that knowledge. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, what? Acknowledge him. Not to just acknowledge him that he exists, but acknowledge him in the fact that God holds the future in his hands and he knows the future before the past came into being. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He's great. He's awesome. Let me leave character. The next thing that makes Jesus Christ qualify, not only his character, but his purposes in life. His purposes in life. In the 55th chapter of Isaiah, he tells us that he's sending his word out. And he's sending his word out for what? A purpose. And that purpose is that all men might know that he is God, that he is the Elohim, he is the Jehovah God. In the Old Testament, he was always disproving these other little tribal gods. That was what happened when he brought the plagues, when his people were down in Egypt, and he showed through the prophets that these other little, small, weak gods that you serve can come close to me. In Isaiah chapter 42 and 43, he says that I am God. There are no other gods. And what I say, nobody can reverse it and turn it around or stop it from happening. Amen? And he says that when my word goes out, why do I send it? It has a purpose. And that purpose is that all will know about me and that they will come, what? To serve me. And my word will not boomerang and come back to me until it has accomplished the purpose for which I sent it. And he is the same God today. He's still doing it. He just, do, he just does it a different way. That's all. But he says in his word, and let's look at some of some of his purposes. When we look at the Old Testament and the prophets, when he took Jonah, his purpose was through Jonah what? To go to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites. He hated them. But his purpose was to try to save them. He made Jonah go where Jonah didn't want to go. And when his word left Jonah's mouth, what happened? The whole nation came to repentance. He says that again in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten son that what? Whosoever believeth. Now, we got to understand, everybody is not going to believe in Jesus Christ. Some folk are going to be lost, but not because he has predetermined that or he has ordained that. It's because they have decided they want to go to hell. And let me, let me, let me qualify this and be very stringent at this. God does not send anybody to hell. You see this Cain? This Cain says God sends nobody to hell. If I end up in hell, it's because I chose to go to hell. His purpose was when he came in this world is that I might have eternal life. Look again at the drama in the fourth chapter of, uh, of, of John's gospel. The woman, when she ran back to the village, what did she say? Come see a man that told me everything about me. He told me everything inside and outside. He knew stuff that I had forgotten about. And he revealed it. And I never told nobody else. He's got to be a special man. Now, we're told by John, because of her testimony, some believed in Jesus. 
But then there were others said, like Missourians have this mythical slogan, show me. Hey! So those that were in the show me state, Sister Briggs, they said, we got to go see for ourselves. And after they went and saw, then they told her, we have seen him, we heard him, now we know for a fact you were right. We know that he is the Savior of the world. Connect that with what John says in his first epistle, chapter 1, and he begins out by saying, I am telling you this and passing it on to the believers, that which we have seen and heard and handled with our hands. That he is what? The Christ, the Son of God, that came to save the sins of the world. So his character is impeccable, right? Repeat after me. God's character is impeccable, perfect. He cannot lie. He cannot go back on his word. Secondly, repeat after me. His purpose are undaunted. You can't stop it. When he speaks, it will happen. In Galatians chapter 6, he says, Be not deceived. God ain't made a fool of. Whatsoever a man, anybody, man is generic there. Whatever you do, honey child is coming back to you. Now, I got to get up on that one. Got to get up on that one. When the kids say, gata, 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 gata. Now, some folk don't believe that God will judge you. Did you know that? They believe that they are slick enough to slide and to scheme and to get by. Now, that scripture is not specific. Just bear with me, would you, for a moment. That scripture doesn't say that if I sow something bad tonight, that will come back to me. Or this week, I will be faced with it. Or next month. Or the middle of the year. Or the end of the year. But it is emphatic that God says, Whatever I say or do that impacts in a negative way some other life or blocks someone from coming to Christ, his judgment is going to fall. Now, I've seen that happen. I have observed that in my 74 years. Sometimes it might come 10 years later, 15 years later. It might come at the end of your life when you're getting ready to die. You don't know. But the reality of it is that it will come before you leave this earth. Young folk, it will come. Start, if you're not doing it, start treating folk the way you want to be treated. Don't go in life self-conceited and thinking that life owes you something. Life don't owe you, and I'm... Forgive me for using this term. Like the old you doodly squat. Yeah. Well. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. Spit it out. But I'm just telling you what the truth is. You got to understand that clearly. Your mother and your father, the home that you were nurtured in, they will love you. They will do everything that they can to support you. But when you leave that haven, that nest, like that little eagle that the mother kicks out so they can fly, and after they learn how to fly and to feed themselves, what happens? That mother eagle is gone. And that little eagle has to what? Forge for itself. Life is rough, but life can be navigated. I'm coming to an end now. I need some warriors. 
I need some moaning. I need some groaning, Michelle. Come from the old era. I'm sorry. Can't change. Life can be navigated. And it can be navigated not on your own. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the insight. We're not able to do it on our own. But there is somebody. And I'm not telling you what I read going to seminary or college or what somebody else told me, but I'm telling you through personal experience, God will. Yes. Now let me give you the last area. Character purposes. The last one is promises. The promises of God. He says in Hebrews 13, 5, what? I will never, never leave you. Neither will I, what? And that word forsaken in Hebrew means to abandon. Like we hear about uh, a child, an infant being born and being left on somebody's doorstep. Or put in a trash can or whatever the case might be. I, I will never leave you to try to what? Navigate a struggle on your own. I'm going to be there. Now somebody posed this, this particular question. Well, you can't see him. How do you know he's there? You know he's there because of his Holy Spirit that lives in you. And you know he's there because there is the communication of prayer. And believe me when I tell you that God does truly, basically, he will answer prayer. In Isaiah, the 65th chapter, he says, before, notice this, before you call on me, I've already answered. Oh, yeah! And while you're still talking to me, now who else can give me a guarantee like that? Nobody. His character, his purposes, his promises. Go to the fourth chapter of Isaiah, and God is speaking to his people. And he says, Israel, Jacob, ain't you heard? Don't you know? Haven't you come to the reality now that the Lord, the God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not. Doesn't get tired. Because in this sinful flesh, I get tired. He doesn't get tired. And you have to worry about it in terms of him sleeping. He spoke, and everything in the universe appeared. He has all power. Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the young man. He giveth strength to those that are weak. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, have mercy. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Then he says in Psalm 34, 35, and 36, he talks about, the psalmist says, let's magnify the Lord. And he doesn't, he doesn't become selfish, Reverend Harden. He said, come with me. Let us together magnify the Lord. Let's lift his name. Why? Because he's worthy of all of our exaltation. 
Anything that we can say or do or bring to him does not make up for the salvation and the grace that he's given to us. Do you know? Do you know the guarantee that he gave, that he backs up his statement? Come and go with me to Calvary. He ain't just talking. He ain't giving us a lot of hot air and saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. If I'm low, I'm meek and hard. You will find rest unto your soul. He ain't just saying that. Come and go with me to Calvary. It's him, the one that talked with the Samaritan woman, the one that healed the cripples, the one that spoke and the dead came back to life. That's him hanging on that cross in the middle of two thieves. One thief says, if you're so great, if you're God, if your guarantee is valid, Come down. Bring us down with you. Let us get out of this mess. But the other thief said, undoubtedly you don't fear him. I know he's God. There's something in this man that's different from us. And then he looks to me and says, when you get in your kingdom, I don't know where it is. I don't know when it's going to be. But will you just remember me? And that song says, remember me when I'm old and gray. Remember me when burdens are crushing me down. Then he looks at the young man or the thief and he says, today, not this evening, not an hour from now, not three minutes from now, not a second from now, but right now you will be with me in paradise. Guaranteed. He looks down at the crowd and he says his father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand me. They don't know in terms of why I came. Guarantee. And then when things started getting rough for him from a human standpoint, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Daddy hadn't gone nowhere. Sometimes don't you feel when you pray to him in prayer, it looks like he's gone somewhere and you have those words that are echoing in your own soul. Father, have you forsaken me? But God ain't gone nowhere. He's right there silently behind the scenes, listening, watching, caring for his own. But then he and his father got together. And Lord have mercy. When you link up with God in your own personal life, and when he reveals his presence and his power, it's such a sweet thing. The hymn writer said, I know he lives because he walks with me. He talks with me. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He tells me that I'm his own. You say that ain't enough guarantee. You, some of you are saying he died like all of us are going to die. Yes, he did die. In fact, he didn't have any life insurance. Didn't have any burial insurance. Somebody had pity on him, one of his good friends. <laughs> Put him in his grave. <laughs> but he didn't mind. Because he wasn't going to be there long anyway. It was just a temporary stop in his life. And hey! Yeah! Hey! Oh, yeah. oh, Lord! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Lord. Sunday morning! He got up! 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 All oh, power! Not some power! Not congressional power! Not presidential power! Not export and import power! Not world power! All oh, power! 
over heaven and earth. Hell also is in his power. Satan can't do nothing unless he gives him permission. All power. Yeah. All. Oh, oh, yeah. All power. Uh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He lives because he lives in my soul. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I know he lives. I know he lives. I'm like the woman from Samaria. I'm a living, bona fide, warm-blooded uh, witness to the fact that Jesus Christ can back up his claims. And one of these days, uh, when this mortal frame of mine uh, will be discarded in a grave, and I'm going to f I'm going to be clothed in immortality, and I'm going to stand in His presence and hear Him say, "Sarah, Sarah, Sarah, oh, Sarah." He's Lord. He's king. Like Dr. S. M. Lockridge said, you can't live without him. And you can't live with him sometimes. But he's real. He's real. Some of you who are listening under the sound of this dying voice, you may not believe it, but he's real. And I take his guarantee any day Amen. over Sears' guarantee. All Sears can do is just guarantee that that washer, that refrigerator, or that stove won't break down. But you see, one day I won't need no refrigerator, no washing machine and stove. I won't need all this junk that I'm carrying now. But he's going to clothe me in glory, and I'm going to have a robe. And that robe won't need to go through a washing machine because it's already been washed with his blood. And I'm going to see the nail scars in his hands. And I'm going to bow down with the rest of heaven and say, Glory! Oh, glory! Ah, oh, Lord. Good to know him. Good to know him. If you don't have him on your journey, I am recommending that you take him, not as your partner, not as your peer, as your pal, not, not as your co-pilot, none of that mess. But take him as your savior. Take him as your Lord. Take him as your redeemer. Let him give you a new life. Let him regiment your mind, your thinking. Let him give you a new mind. Let him purify and cleanse your heart and give you a new attitude on life. And whatever you're going through, and this is not just a statement of, uh, of uh, how can I say it, like some preachers that I've heard and they go on the idea of motivation and try to make folk feel good. Uh, there's nothing about Jesus that will make you feel good. What he tells you is absolute guarantee. And he says, you come unto me, you're laboring. It's rough for you, but I'll give you rest. He says in the 16th chapter of John, to those that are in him, he said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. But be of good cheer. Somebody asked the question, how in the world can I laugh in the midst of trouble? It's possible. Have you ever done it before? Have you ever found 
acquiring peace on the inside. I don't mean stuff going on around you. Because there's always going to be stuff. Stuff don't leave in this life. When I leave here, stuff is going to be circling somebody else. But I'm talking about in the midst of the stuff, that there was a sense of his abiding presence. There was a sense of his strength. There was a sense of his calmness that he was there. And if you notice, God does not reveal the road five or six or ten miles down the road. All he does is just open up. One step at a time. But some of us get greedy. And we say, Lord, that one step ain't enough for me. I want to see to the end of the block. I want to know what's downtown. And the Lord said, no, no. Because if I told you, you can handle it anyway. You can't even handle it today. You messed up yesterday. Ow! But I'm in control of tomorrow. And I tell you what I'm going to do if you just let me do it. Now, the thing that's so goody-goody about him, he doesn't, he, 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 he doesn't take you like we have seen uh, uh, how, how they do terrorists and what they call uh, waterboard you and threaten you and beating you. No, he doesn't do that. What he does, he just says that I'm here. And when life beats you down and you find out that you can't navigate, I'm here. I won't walk away from you. I won't tell you I told you so. Folk will tell you that. Parents sometimes will tell you that. Maybe they should. I don't know. But Jesus said, no, no, I'll never tell you that. And the reason why I won't tell you that because you already know that. But I'm here. To take care of you. It's invitation for discipleship. I didn't say invitation for churchship. I didn't say invitation for pastorship. I said invitation for discipleship. Disciples belong to Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can save you. I can't save you. No church can save you. No denomination can save you. No philosophy can save you. No ideology can save you. Only the man from Galilee. Everywhere I go, everywhere I be, oh Jesus, he's mine in the morning, mine in the evening, all the day long, singing my song. He's mine, mine in the evening. All the day long, singing my song, Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine. Everywhere I go, everywhere I be, oh Jesus. Y'all can help us say he's mine in the morning.